Recording in progress. I do not consent. That every will never time. not be funny. <laughs> every time. <laughs> we should keep that in so people know that every single time. This is the kind just of just so that we, we know that. Uh, just so everyone knows that Chris doesn't consent to being recorded. It's a weird every time. It's a weird position for a podcaster, you know. So oh. this is uh, cause I don't know. I remember we did the snowy day last year. That's right. And uh, but we've. You uh, would just did one of those reruns. Was it a holiday one? But we did a. And I, I, you know, it was no when, offense, but let's see. I'm sure <laughs> to you, but like, no, it, it was it all what, 2016. Together, you know, yeah, I think yeah. There was an but o, I was like, wow. uh, an O sixteen episode that I ran <laughs> where we were talking about Christmas specials in general. Um, I, I I've been running reruns this week. On the main uh, podcast feed, I have a couple of uh, oh, smart. Th- this is one of two of the new holiday episodes, so everybody can enjoy some new stuff too. So, I think most of it was talking about movies, and then uh, one was uh, me talking with someone about family relationships and things. Uh, me and uh, Lee Messersmith, who's been on my show a bunch, but and then so a couple of those reruns, and then there's going to be me and you here now talking about stuff and then i'm going to run uh pretty soon my interview with the creators of the movie fat man as well the the writers and director two brothers that did that together so wow i love what you've been doing you know it's i mean if we want to talk about muppets christmas carol and family relationships i don't know you but this movie yeah yeah for me it's like um the first thing i think of is just watching it with my family and a tradition that's now continued on to like I now watch it with my in-laws well, and my wife's family every year. Was it just, and it's funny, it's become my kids' uh, favorite as well. Uh, was it the 20th anniversary just barely? Can that possibly be right? No, Must it can't have. have been that. It went the 25th or something, right? Um, I'm going to pull up the date of release. I saw this in the theaters, so <laughs> I was like 17 or something. Um when it came out, I think, because I, I was in the theaters with my uh, parents and brother and sister, and uh, because I remember watching like a making of special and then seeing it like the next day, which was always like nowadays, it, there's those are all over the place. You can just pull that up on IMDb and then go see the movie later or watch it streaming at home. But this was in 1992. There we go. 1992. So actually, I would have been younger than that. I would have been. Uh, uh, yeah, whatever that is like when you take away five, 15, I would have been 15. There we go. So, uh, yeah, I was 15 when this came out, and and but it was it was more unusual than to see something uh, and then go see the movie right away. At least for me, at least for me, it was. Um, and for all of us to go and and see a movie it was pretty cool. I'm trying to think. So my uncle owned uh, a couple of videos, like a chain of video stores in Boston when I was younger. Yeah. As a kid, so we would always get movies like before they were out of theaters. So I'm gonna guess that we had a copy of this advanced because of him. Ooh, but um, that's cool. And those kind of hookups back then. Nowadays, it's kind of like, oh, somebody will send me a streamer if I know someone who's a movie critic, maybe. Or you get a lot of people see things early. It seems like uh, they're yeah. still cool, but it's not back then. It was like unheard of cool, right? Yeah, because like I get stuff early now. Some sometimes for, for certain things, mostly stuff I don't really know or care about, which mm-hmm. is you know just my interest. Like the how only you got th- to go to the premiere of Dune and how they let you like edit the new spider-man movie right a little access like that yeah uh, yeah you know you know i did get to see it early which was actually really cool though was the uh the last blockbuster before it came out or not yeah. before actually i think i got to see it yeah i got to see a press screening of that because of uh because taylor has become a friend and we were doing something he just sent it to me unprovoked i was like oh because yeah. he was on your show too right yeah, he's done yeah. the show. We did a we did a panel together uh, with some other people about uh, punk rock documentaries because he had made one about ska and Blockbuster was all done but about to come out. So he's like, he sent me a link before we did that, and I was like, oh my god, this is like really good. You got to come on the podcast now, and uh, cool. I gotta hitch myself to your wagon because this is inc- <laughs> that's cool. Yeah, so that kind of access back then, your uncle hooking you up. I remember having this. This is one of the VHS tapes. And uh, this one came out, and it was one of those in the big plastic, like clamshell holders. Picture it because we had it at my grandparents' house too. It was like what? Yes, it wasn't the the thin cardboard. It was like an event because it, uh, dude. I can like as you're saying that I haven't thought about that in forever. I can I can smell the box as I think about it. Plastic has that classic picture on the front of like the the poster of the movie, of course. 
Yeah. Yep. I remember yeah. the day and then the tape was all around and you had to like someone didn't rewind it and it was like a fight with your family. <laughs> Did you ever have one of those VHS rewinders, by the way, the separate thing sitting next to the VCR that yeah, you could put but the tape like, in to rewind it <laughs> so that you didn't have to wait to start the next thing? <laughs> yeah, but in my family, we were always like years <laughs> beyond. By the time those were no longer cool we uh, or needed, like I'm sure DVD players had come out and then we got that. <laughs> like, yeah, we're always exactly. We're always a few generations psychologically behind in my households growing. Yeah, no, I know what you mean. It's uh, and and the interest. There's a couple of interest, really interesting things about this movie, and the content, of course, is you know mainly like you said, we're going to be talking about what it means with relationships and things. Interestingly enough, there are several people out there I found, and I, I would say I'm not quite. Uh, I'm not quite an extreme on this, uh, but being someone who's a big fan of the story of Christmas Carol, I have found that a lot of people actually view this as their favorite retelling of that, their favorite movie version. And I would say it's up there in my top, I don't know, couple. Um, oh, it's my... Yeah, your favorite? Yeah, but I also don't like that story outside of this movie, so I, I don't count. Interesting. Yeah. Well, I don't... Sure, it's a fine story. It's just it, it's not one that I, I go I don't turn to outside of the Muppet Christmas Carol. Yeah. Have you ever read it? In school. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I'm I'm a fan of the book as well, the short book, I guess you could say. Um and actually, you know, one of the things that I, I find about this, and people say it teasingly sometimes that Michael Caine's performance as Scrooge is one hundred percent swinging for the fences serious. He is not acting different he's not trying to be silly scrooge he's trying to be scrooge he is being scrooge like straight up right and i think that's one of the great um strengths of this this movie is that it's not a oh it's a you know it's a silly movie or it has silly elements in some ways it's just trying to be a christmas carol and then you have the muppet silliness but but kane is not trying to be silly yeah, and I'd even go farther to say even the Muppets aren't even silly in this. Like every performer outside of Rizzo and Gonzo, who are kind of like our our avatars of like how ridiculous this like Hermit and like every performer is playing this movie so straight and so serious. It's like you do forget they're Muppets. Like you really yeah. forget that they're like that. Like you, it's like you ha- you forget at one point that you're watching uh, Michael Caine mm-hmm. and uh, and puppets. Like yeah. every. But the only time you get that little break from like the the Christmas story is Rizzo and Gonzo, which right. to me, like I guess as a kid too, that was my way into this because like they added some humor to a dark story. The performers also, I've you know, you've heard this from anybody who's worked with Muppets when they make these movies, um, is that the performers lose track of the fact, like even in between takes, they'll find themselves talking to the Muppet not to the guy who's like sitting right there that they can clearly yeah. see next, who's operating and voicing or whatever. Um, but yeah. they're talking oh my- to Kermit, not to the puppeteer or Muppeteer or whatever. Yeah. A puppet. Yeah. My, my dream is to meet, like to do an interview with a Muppet. Uh, I'm a, I don't know if you know how much of a Muppet fan. I'm a huge fan of the Muppets. <laughs> I, uh, I listen to Matt Vogel, who is uh, now doing Kermit's uh, podcast below the frame. I go to tough pigs. Oh. I like Muppet history. <laughs> uh, I've been a fan of the Muppets since I was a kid, probably probably Muppet Babies would have been my introduction, but I do recall this movie from a very young age. So I'll, I'll, this is a good time to drop this. If you go out on YouTube, I don't know if anybody's ever done this, but the Muppet holiday special uh, was a TV special that was made a long time ago. It's fantastic, but because of distribution rights of some of the music and stuff, it's never really been packaged, but it is on YouTube and they've let it be on YouTube. Uh, and you can find it. It's actually the first, I believe, the first appearance of the Muppet Babies because they're sitting around. The, the premise of it is is that they go over to, they're going to Fozzie's mom's house. It's a farmhouse out in the middle of nowhere. And they're going to oh, surprise yeah. her so she won't have to be alone for the holidays. But she's all packed up and ready to go on, on vacation. She's all excited to like go to the Bahamas. And then all of a sudden, everybody, uh, everyone arrives. <laughs> And so she's she's sort of like Airbnb'd her house, although they didn't call it that back then. She's rented out her house for the holiday to uh, an old man and a dog who turn out to be uh, Doc and Sprocket from the Fraggles, right? Wow, like Marvel. <laughs> well, no, this is this is like the Muppet Cinematic Universe, if you will, which would still be the MCU because they have the Sesame Street characters join them. And there's a part where uh, Kermit and Robin actually find a Fraggle hole. And go inside, and they meet the Fraggles and sing a little bit with them. 
I mean, this is yeah. a this is an all encompassing kind of special. It's not on Disney Plus. It's not. No, it's not anywhere. I I had been thinking about it, and I Googled it. In fact, I just shared. I should post this. I'll put this up on the Twitter or something. But there's an article about it of why it's one of the most heartwarming specials. There's a. I mean, the whole last few minutes is the Muppets basically just sitting around singing Christmas carols at a Christmas party. That's like, uh, and they have a medley of Christmas carols that they all sing together. Um, it's just basically <laughs> heartwarming, just to be heartwarming. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, I used to love the Sesame Street Christmas episode, the Feliz Navidad, where Big Bird gets trapped outside. Like I, I actually found uh, the vinyl record of that. Uh, a few years ago at Symposium Books in Providence and immediately had to buy it. And I would, I, it like brought me to tears listening to it. It was so beautiful. Isn't Fucking crazy? Muppets are, yeah. are they just the-, the, the Muppets really tap into something that for some reason they can get away with when they, they can be wholesome and sincere in a way. Even when you watch some of the comedic, you know, you look at the old Muppet movie and things like that. It's funny and silly with the humor. And at the same time, there's like a sincerity. And I think that's probably what it is, is because even when they are trying to be funny or silly, it's a sincere, lots of kind of just like, you know, they're not they're not going for anything that is super. I'll give you my uh, super sophisticated in a way. My my best go to example of Muppet humor would be in the Muppet movie when they have that recurring gag where um Kermit keeps being confronted with things about frogs and he'll say that's a myth. And he's in a bar the first time he says it, right? And he's yeah. like, no, it's a myth. It's a what? A myth. A myth. And then the waitress comes up and says, yes. <laughs> anyway. So, oh. so and so or they have this just... recurring gag where he'll he'll say, it's a myth. It's a myth. And then this waitress shows up out of nowhere and is like, yes? You know. My other stupid. favorite joke from that movie in that same scene, he goes, drinks on the house. And then Fozzie and uh, Kermit escape. And everybody goes up to they all, The next cut is they're all on the roof. <laughs> right. Yeah. So you've got like this one and that one, and you just mentioned how the Sesame Street Christmas. Um, there's also, of course, like the John Denver and the Muppets Christmas special. Oh yeah. Um, so really, there's yeah. a lot of like holiday and Christmas memories tied to the Muppets. Even and and some of these things were definitely before this movie was made. The holiday special I was just referencing was from the '80s. And, yeah. Um, you're talking about you know the 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 Sesame Street while ago too, and so. When you look at this, this is almost maybe a culmination <laughs> of all of those warm feelings coming into a Christmas carol. And amazingly, it stands up so well today. And they have made other versions of a Christmas carol. Obviously, it's probably one of the most done stories. I mean, right? There's a billion different ones. Um, and some of the newer ones I find kids don't key into. Like they made that one I think they thought was going to be really big with Jim Carrey, the animated mm-hmm. one. Most children I know are horrified by that one. It's really kind of oh, aesthetic is kind of glaring and ugly. There's, I think part of it is because like, I think this is also the first movie after Jim had died, I believe, because I know his son had made this one. And like, but they, I think part of it is like they used a lot of practical effects, like everything CGI. There's no CGI. Well, CGI didn't exist, but like they used a, a, a town of miniatures and like aesthetically it's timeless. Like it's yes. because it's, you know, it's a time period. It looks like the time it's set in, but like the, you know what I'm saying? The, the effects of, like, you know, when you watch it holds like up because it, right, it isn't old technology. It's really old technology to the point to where it just looks like the real world. <laughs> That's the right way I put it. Yeah. Yeah. Where there are certain eras of film where like early CGI just doesn't hold up or like it just looks so bad. But this, yeah, it really, I mean, the God, whoever did the, uh, the set design or and production, uh, the design for the set, like it is, I mean, it looks like, I, when I turn that movie on, I immediately feel like I'm in Victorian England. When you go and look at it, the, the story obviously goes through uh, the Scrooge's life as it is, you know, and one of the major downfalls of many depictions of Scrooge is he's portrayed as a almost like a, a Batman villain in some. I mean, I, I, I'm exaggerating, but in some movies and things, I feel like he's he's downright evil. And yeah. really, the core of the original story is he's sad. Right. I mean, he's sad and mean, basically. That's his thing. Um, and I felt like that's captured pretty well here. He's, you know, he's he may be merciless. He may be unforgiving. He may be inflexible and all those things. But uh, it's really a story of somebody with a lot of trauma and a lot of loneliness. Right. Who's lashing out at the world around him. And I feel like they they showcase that pretty well. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And then and exactly right. When you're when you're sad. Uh, you don't 
make good decisions. You don't treat people well around you. Like that whole, like you treat people, you know, like, you know, at his core, he's just given up and nothing matters. And then what they show so well is he's actually angry and annoyed by people being happy around him. That's that whole like uh, misery loves company thing. Yeah. That's the line. It's a line from the novel as well from the movie, of course. When he's uh, telling his nephew, what right do you have to be happy? You're poor enough. You shouldn't be happy. <laughs> yeah. And it's, I mean, it's a timeless movie, timeless story. It's a timeless story done well. And just, and well, it's great because as you watch it as a viewer, even as a kid, um, you're all aware that that is Kermit the Frog prote- acting. Like, you know, Kermit is like, they, they treat him as if he's a human actor. Like, I don't look, I'm like, it's like, oh my God, look, Kermit is acting. Like, you don't ever think that's Kermit, like you, even when you're watching, you know, right, that's you not know Kermit. it's Bob Cratchit or whatever, right. That's Kermit the Frog pretending to be, you know, it's right. weird, right? A puppet, we're, but that's how connected, like, that's how emotionally ingrained we are with connected to these puppets where we feel like they're real. I mean, I do. Sure. I mean, I. No, I, it's honestly, interesting though. I, I mean, it is interesting the whole way that that is created because uh, you don't, yeah, you don't watch John Wick and say like, why is Keanu Reeves hitting people? It's like, no, it's because it's a character. But yeah, exactly. the Muppets, it, 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 even as a kid, you buy it the same way of like, oh, that's him being that person. Yeah. I'm like, Kermit's a good actor. I actually, I think I'm sure I said that when I was nine. What I a remember, good actor. and I may have, I may have picked up on this from my parents at that age, although I was old enough to maybe have noticed this, but I remember there being a certain amount of anxiety going into this movie when it was new of how is Kermit going to sound? Because Brian, and I believe... Um, as Brian Henson took over for for when Jim Henson passed away, right? Um, oh, that's it. Was not Jim Jim Henson classically was I mean was Kermit, right? I mean, there's the whole identity almost as much as Walt Disney was Mickey Mouse, right? <laughs> kind of a thing. Yeah. But to, but he voiced him, he performed him, and all those different things. And and I remember there being a a visceral relief of how good Kermit sounded, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Yeah. Hundred percent. Hundred, and is can we just take a moment to recognize Frank Oz? He's also Yoda. <laughs> like <laughs> that's right. Yes, <laughs> that guy not done. Like he, he's like a part of so. Like I don't. Uh, I'm kind of morbid sometimes. I'll have that thought of like, what celebrity death is going to wreck me? And like, I think Frank Oz is going to be the day he passes away. The whole culture pauses and be like, oh my god, this man is responsible for so many pieces of different people's fandoms. Like my wife loves Star Wars, has like a Star Wars tattoo. Like she's obsessive, and and there are people like that with the Muppets, and there's obviously crossover or both. But like to have that much of an influence in two different fandoms. One of the things that I always find interesting is how quickly Scrooge, when he's confronted with his past, starts to already um, he he starts to feel guilty right away. Um, as yeah. soon as he starts to gain awareness. And you see some of this, too, where Michael Caine portrays that when he goes back in time and sees himself and all this. He immediately gets excited, right? There's a reconnection to some hope and some joy that he that has died that he used to have, right? Which is really interesting. So is this whole movie just kind of like a visual representation of what it's like to process like stuff neurologically in a dream or like microdosing or like, like uh you know like cause, or trauma therapy yeah because like he's you know they they use the dream as the disguise i'm like this feels like some of my emdr sessions i've had mm-hmm. yeah like, i was I like, curious your thoughts of it approaching it after we and we just did that episode about trauma and emdr yeah. and i also shared our, our episode about the west wing uh and trauma so there's a lot of you I, and me this christmas season for the <laughs> listeners of the broken brain podcast <laughs> I'm on this. I recorded this. Like, I was just like super excited. I forgot we had, not forgot. You know how it is. I was like, sure. Oh, yeah. I did this with Dwight. I can't. I'm like, we did good. <laughs> yeah. So, so if the reruns aren't overkill for everybody, then uh, whatever. But uh, Merry, Merry Christmas to us getting to be out on the feed that much. Now, I think it's really true when you look at it the idea of the past and present and future. What's that he says at the end, right? I'll, I'll live in the past and the present and the future. And I remember being a kid and hearing that on all the movies and in the story, that line. It was always just kind of a, oh, whatever. Um, didn't really, I don't know that I really fathomed anything about it. But I think being more old and mature, you look back and say, living in the past, the present, and the future, that's a pretty significant uh, yeah. point of view, really, to carry around with you. Like, 
how do you balance your memories with your expectations of the future, and how do you appreciate, like, that's mindfulness, right? Appreciation of the present. And how do you balance all that out, I think, is very difficult. Um, yeah, and, like, someone like me, I have what they call a childhood, amne- a childhood amnesia. Like, I don't remember much of childhood. Like, it, I have to have someone really help me mm-hmm. spark the memory, get them back which is not uncommon with trauma or ADHD kids, uh, people. So hello. <laughs> got the old, the dumb me there. So like, I, but like, yeah, no, I really re- connected with him, like seeing himself in his past. And like, I'm going to assume that Scrooge was one, one like me who doesn't like to revisit their past for whatever reason, just Scrooge just down and depressed and who gives a shit. You know, there's a, an element of the past that's actually missing from the movie. Uh, <laughs> when you look at it, Uh, And oh, and by the way, this is as good as any. I found this out and I want to share it just from the movie making standpoint. You know how the ghost of this is my favorite representation of the ghost of Christmas past. That's one that in the book is really kind of a weird description. Charles Dickens was tripping on something. I don't know. And you can't really for me, I never could tell what it looked like. And you look at it in other movies and it's just kind of like a ghost or it's a little kid or in uh, the old musical with Albert Finney. It's just a matronly woman. Um and uh, anyway, but this one I really like because uh, they, they capture this sort of weird ghostly past. It's childlike. But but anyway, you know when the ghost is like floating there in front of Scrooge? The listen- yeah, yeah. Listeners to the audio can't see me doing my arms like this. But the way they did that, I just found out. The puppet, they, they filmed it underwater. Yeah. yeah. And then they just, just edited it into the frame. I thought that was, that was fantastic to yeah. learn that. That, that goes scared the shit out of me as a kid. Still does. <laughs> comfortable. But there is a part that's missing there. They used to have a song. Isabel sings to him, right, about breaking up, basically. And, and she sings this great song called The Love Is Gone. It was really, really sad. I, I remember that we had it on our VHS copy of this movie. We had that song because yeah. I remember every year when we'd watch it, I'd be like, it's the sad part coming up, you know. And then that song comes back around and there's a reprise at the end that is still included where uh, they sing The Love We Found at the very, very end of the, the movie. It's the very last thing that we hear is them singing The Love We Found, which is a reprise of that song, which is The Love We Lost, essentially. The interesting thing is you go watch it on Disney Plus or a DVD, it's not going to be on there. Yeah, why? I, yeah. I, 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 I know I've heard that too. And- I don't think I have an original copy kicking around. So I, I watched Disney Plus. Well, what happened was that there was a, there was a disagreement amongst the people in post production of whether or not it uh, whether or not that that was too sad for a children's movie, right? And oh, wow. there was a big fight. Brian Henson wanted it to be in, and uh, there was uh, some of the executive level who kind of like blocked it and so what happened was it went from the movie to vhs and then when it was on the vhs tapes when they were remastering or whatever they have to do to bring it onto dvd um there was this fight where there was a they stopped releasing it on some of the vhs cuts and essentially what happened was they they didn't have uh the the cleaned up enough version of it so that anyway what it went through dvd and it went to and they had all the originals and i guess you need to have some of the original film to do that translation process and the originals Mm -hmm. were gone so by the time it got to the streaming level and like all of the you know trying to make it look good nowadays um essentially what i read was if they did put it in with old copies that they do have access to, it would look terrible. It would all of a sudden, the movie quality, sound, and picture would take a dive for that musical number and then noticeably go back up. And so they just, that is fascinating. They just haven't done it. Yeah. Because they don't have the originals. So, <laughs> wow. Yeah. Cause that, that song does make the movie make a little more sense. It like certainly when they, is, yeah. More emotional sucker punch at that point. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, what's funny too, is my, uh, my mother-in-law is, is a teacher and has been a teacher for many years. And, um, taste wise, she is one of those, she only watches BBC basically. Like she's one of those people and Muppet Christmas Carol, same thing. That's like one of the few things that we both, her and I love that we sit down together as a family to watch, like everything else we'll watch together. It's like, not that it's bad. It's just, you know, she, she's more of an intellectually, uh, she's more of a baker and a reader and I'm more of a TV person, but it's just so funny how it's like, cause I, I actually, oddly enough, 
outside of like Sherlock and this, I don't really like the British things. Uh, so it's funny how Muppet Christmas Carol is that thing that can, uh, as evidenced it, by you counting Muppet Christmas Carol as a British thing, just there. Yeah. <laughs> Michael Caine's in it. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, not British. Uh, time period. That's the oh, I just, oh, period piece. I got gotcha, you. I got gotcha. you. Yeah, I don't really like time period. Right. And right. On a, for another day, we can explore why I hate sure. reenact. Sherlock, also modern times, by the way. <laughs> Still a time period. <laughs> <laughs> Still a time period. This I don't like anything say- that takes place within time. That's why you yeah, like Loki only- so much. Watch has been Sherlock. I don't like call the midwife, all that stuff. Well, oh, even like the- yeah. Never, I don't even watch the British office. We're going to have to. Uh, we're going to have to dig in. Now, I will say British office. Uh, I like the American version a lot better. However, I do love call the midwife. Pretty good. So, yeah. Go. And Doctor Who. So. I we don't like that. Ways on that. Oh wow! So yeah, we'll I have don't... to have another another uh, session to figure out what's wrong with you. Uh, yeah, I don't dislike <laughs> Doctor Who. I just don't like it. Mm. Well, you know what I mean? It's all I right. don't have it. It takes all kinds. Or and there's episodes of it I've enjoyed, but I'll never go out of my way to. Uh... <laughs> well, some of the fandom has annoyed the hell out of me. You know, we can just uh, get away from my weird issues for now. <laughs> <laughs> Am I going to get visited by the ghost of Dwight tonight? <laughs> Were you? Uh, did you? Have, were you afraid when you watched this movie as a kid? Like that, that the ghost, the the first, that little baby ghost is the only one that that and the death Muppet at the end really used to like really not nightmares, but like I remember really like getting very tense. Even now, I still get a little clenched up when that scene comes on. Like it, it hits hard. It hits hard. Well, it's funny when you say that because uh, of course, of course, I I saw it at age fifteen for the first time. Um, cause it's when it came out. Right. And so I didn't have the little kid experience with it that mm. nowadays that like that my kids have had and that people have now, um, because of being so old, but the, I will say, I was never scared by the ghost of Christmas past. I didn't really see that, but the, but future, I think they actually captured the scariness of the, the ghost of Christmas yet to come. I should say that's what it's called. Mm. Uh, they captured that well in this one. I think probably better than any other version I've ever seen um, because of just the way that I think with the Muppetry, you can make it to where the the hands aren't, the hands are the only part of their body you can see and they're not human really. And then there's the big swirling kind of like, you know, robe and cape and everything, Um, which I had read that they actually did use the same fabric as the bed, curtains that he's hugging at the end there's some like like difference of how they present it or whatever but so with that whole control yeah you have that big hulking like you can always feel like you should just barely be able to see in there and you just can't <laughs> mm. yeah and i think you know it's interesting because as growing up there's other things about it that become scary right which is the thing that scares scrooge right the thing that scares scrooge of course I, and when I was a little kid, the one of the differences for me is I thought that Scrooge was scared of dying and that if he was nicer, he wouldn't die or at least not die so soon. Now mm. I realize, looking back on that, he's an old man. He knows he's going to die. You know, the scary thing wasn't death. The scary thing was the reactions to his death. The scary things. That's what he says as soon as he sees like, the people yeah. selling things and talking about somebody died. And he says, oh, yeah, that could be me. I could, I see that could be me. I could, that could be me. I get it. I, and he's like already, I believe, already clicked into the fact that it is him, but he doesn't want to admit it. No, I totally get it. It's like he's kind of like confronting the lack of legacy of like what he's going to be leave behind because you die like I don't Maybe maybe this more hits to you and me as people who decided to uh, record their voice and put it out there for the entire universe for infinite and ever, uh, like remembered. You know, like it's and then like, God, imagine if like it hurt. It hurts my brain to think if I if I went and no one remembered me or no one cared or like, like you know, like in a weird way, your funeral is kind of like this last chance to dunk on everyone. Every funeral you go to, you're like, <laughs> it's always like this weird petty thing. It's like who showed up, blah blah blah. Oh, you yeah. say, oh my god, oh my god, can you see that? Oh, James came, wow, like you know, and like you know, not everyone on earth is fortunate to live long enough, or even you know, I've, I've worked for, for the like I'd say a lot of the forgotten population in the years, and there's times that like I, the staff member, have showed up to the funeral, not the family, yeah. and you know, so it's 
there's something to that when you kind of see Scrooge being like, oh my God, everyone hates me. Well, I think that's because Scrooge has no self-awareness because he's so depressed. Mm -hmm. He's so sad. He's so miserable. He just, he doesn't, he's just so focused. He just, he doesn't even realize he's hated. And it's an interesting thing where at the beginning of the story, he would say, I, I bet if he was just pressed with the question, or if someone said to him in the street, when you die, no one's going to go to your funeral, he would have said, I don't care, right? But then when yeah. it's actually played out, and I think that's like so many things when people say, oh, I don't care, when it actually comes down to it, they care quite a lot, right? And that's... Yeah, I, I'm kind of ashamed of how, not yeah, I'm almost ashamed of how much I do care. Hmm. Well, it's interesting, though. I mean, I think there's awareness. You're talking about emotional awareness of saying, like, it would hurt me, and I, maybe I carry that around with me in a way that hopefully affects the way I act, you know? Uh, yeah. yeah. Like, I want you know, to be remembered well. And, like, you know, I started my podcast for, like, uh, a myriad of reasons, like anyone. But one of one of the reasons, like, the really, like, subconscious stuff I've learned later on is, like, I've, I've had a lot of loss in my life. And when you lose people, it's the voice is the thing. You can, you can always look at a picture. But like, if you don't have someone's voice, um, I don't know, the voice is always the thing that can bring you back. And like in some weird, some weird, like subconscious way, I'm like, and part of it was like this weird, like leaving a legacy behind. Sure. It's mostly poop and fart jokes and talking about like punk bands, but still. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's a part of you. I mean, you put yourself into it. Right. And that's one of the yeah. things that. Well, uh, that was on your uh, podcast with the EMDR too. Like that's probably like, that's, that's one for the record books. Yeah. I thought probably popular podcast episode i've ever been on ever yours the What's emdr the, episode. oh and we had the emdr episode right right yeah I've never been on a i've never gotten so much feedback or anything from anyone or just like from other people and just everything so isn't that the lesson right be more authentically you and vulnerable yeah. and shit yeah that works <laughs> no i think that's true i and i think that um i was gonna say the, with the hearing people's voice, um, it's totally it's totally true because uh, you'll find this too as your uh, as your one gets uh, older, and as the voice changes, it's almost a little sad when the little baby voice goes away, and and you don't notice it as dramatically as when you go back and play old movies. Or I found a bunch of old audio recordings um, and video clips from my kids just, just a little while ago. And we were listening to them and it was like, Oh my gosh, you know, um, it's like this little yeah. tiny voice and, uh, you know, and so when you have those things, it really does trigger. And then you get to, you know, live in the past, the present and the future. Yeah. You know, like, you know, I'm, you know, I'm 84. So there's, I, I, I have, friend, I have some friends and family I've lost and I don't have any recording of their voices. Yeah. And, yeah, I remember my friend Ken had taken his life years back and really sucked, obviously. And uh, we worked at a summer camp together. And in one of the promotional videos, uh, he was in it for like a few seconds with our other friend, Nick, who had also died. And it was like, I must have watched that. We would watch that clip of Nick and Ken on repeat because it was our two friends. They had died years apart. And uh, it was really sad, but it was like, it was just... We would just watch it over and over. And then in your head, you can like, have met, I don't know, it, it, it just uh, it unlocks and it triggers something. And I think that it really, it does tie in with that idea of what is coming. That's the scary part. When you look at what Scrooge compares as well, uh, when he immediately goes and sees Tiny Tim, right? He asks the ghost to show me warmth oh. associated with death, right? And then, oh. and he sees this grieving that's going on and it's really interesting to see the contrast there of like here's someone who lived only a few years right comparatively and then there's Scrooge who lived the a whole life right yeah yeah and like the difference in the way people feel at the departure you know um well and like and also like in Scrooge's mind he's wealthy so therefore he's loved and valued and he was a poor uh he was a commoner who who cares about this? Like whatever he didn't, he didn't. Uh, Tiny Tim didn't have any money. He didn't build wealth. He didn't build a an, a legacy or a, a building or anything like that. He was just a kid who kid. But then the fact that like it nearly destroys, not destroys, but like emotionally wrecks his family, and just the fact that he's like, I lived an entire life and no one cares. It kind of ties into you see where he's confronted with his own words. Um, 
and this is during the Ghost of Christmas present, but when he says, tell me, is Tiny Tim going to die? And he's like, well, if he's going to die, he, he better do it and decrease the surplus population. And that's another famous line from this story, right? It makes it into most of the movies, if not all. Um, one of the things that it shows is, is just like his uncaringness before, what we find is that deep down there's a, there's a sort of hypocrisy there of like, he didn't really necessarily mean it because he never took the time to think about what that actually meant. There's an exchange in the original uh, story. It goes a little bit deeper where the ghost of Christmas present is actually quite harsh with him at that point. And, and he shows him these like bedraggled children that are like, like supposedly like represent hunger and want and need. And he says, you know, basically don't be so quick unless you're going to familiarize yourself with, with um, who the surplus is. If you're going to talk about the surplus, well, who is the surplus? And look at the, and he doesn't say it this way, I don't know, but exactly, I'm paraphrasing, but it's kind of like, are you willing to look at the supposed surplus of the population right in the eye and say, you should die? Because really, chances are you're really not, right? And because he's really, he really isn't. He sits there and sees Tiny Tim for like this cool Christmas dinner, and he essentially falls in love with this camaraderie and this purity uh, of this kid of just saying like, oh no, what are we going to do? We got to, we got to save him. And it's like, well, you didn't really, it wasn't any less right to want to save the people that you didn't see their faces when the two guys came asking for a few bucks to buy some mm. dinners for people. Those are all Tiny Tims out there, but he just didn't ever take the time to get to know who they were, right? So do you, uh, one thing I like about this movie is that it's, it makes it clear that Scrooge isn't a psycho, uh, he's not a sociopath, he's right. just disdained and there is redemption. Yes. Like, and I think there's a lot of people that I don't like or disagree with and uh, kind of clamor up to the wrong side of politically speaking. Um, but like, I think a lot of those people aren't sociopathic evil people at their core. I think they're just uh, misguided and, and, and disconnected. And as speaking of someone who was definitely uh, disconnected emotionally for a most uh, majority of my adult life until, you know, EMDR is all about kind of reconnecting and resetting those circuits um, like I, I can kind of relate and have this fear that if I never met Victoria and, and never got help, like minus being rich, I could have turned into a Scrooge. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. I guess that we all have that within us, right? Like we all could have, like, we could all shut it all down if we like it or not. And then like, I, I guess that's my fear is like, I don't ever want to turn into the Scrooge, but you don't realize you're Scrooge until why well, I always say this to my clients is you don't ever realize how, how bad you felt until you start to feel good. And I think that's what, like he has no idea that he's depressed and miserable and sad and lonely and and, and unloved. And he's unloved. He doesn't even he doesn't even know that he's not loved. Right. That's how this put it. And and a lot of his motivation is fear. There's a line where he is talking to uh, in the the past. Right. There's a scene. It makes it into everything where. He's getting broken up, and you know, Bell comes in and tells him, "You know, you, you really aren't into me anymore. Um, let's let's cut this thing off. Let's let's call it time of death now." And you know, he pushes back. And one of the phrases that uh, didn't make it into Muppet Christmas Carol, but it's in a lot of them, is when he says, uh, "There's nothing in the world that the world is so hard on as poverty, but there's nothing it condemns more than the pursuit of wealth." And it's really interesting because here's the supposed, I mean, we don't say villain of the story, but here's an antagonist protagonist who's saying a thing that sounds very cynical and jaded, but it's also very true, right? And it ties into, I think, a sense of fear. Like, but I know I have to be safe. I have to somehow have security. Uh, we have to, have to, have to, at all cost. And then in the end, of course, he finds the real fear, right? Which is actually I'm much more afraid of being alone, um, which is exactly what I've made happen, you know? And they having yep. his eyes open to that awareness. There's a great another great depiction uh, is there's there's a movie called The Man Who Invented Christmas came out a couple years ago. Uh, it's, got, it. it's got the guy from uh, oh the guy from Downton Abbey who played you know I know you'll know him because of your <laughs> love of period pieces. Uh, <laughs> I uh, have no idea. Played the. By the way, I, I I oh my god I get like three <laughs> when I have to walk through the room and Downton Abbey is on. It's like that or the. I'm like, I have no idea how anyone we can watch get, this. We need to get no, your your one. EMDR therapist and do a show. We'll do a show the three of us where we'll we'll try to confront those well, uh, roots of period. Do you know what actually hates me, <laughs> what I hate more than anything? Reenactors. Reenactors. 
Like, have you ever had to go to those crappy, like, living history kind of things? Oh, like, like that. Like, you go to, like, uh, uh, Virginia and stuff, and they have the whole town where everybody acts, or, or like, are yeah. you ta- you're not talking, like, a Renaissance fair or something, too. You don't hate that, oh, do you? Don't fuck, bring me to a Renaissance. Oh, don't even. No. <laughs> Woo! Uh. Specifically, like, like around here, we have, like, Quaker uh, Village, Surbridge Village, sure, Plymouth sure. Rock. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. That's one of the things I, I miss about the East is, like, uh, going to old town virginia and some of those places yeah i love that stuff I, <laughs> like my whole so like my in-laws and like victoria they also be reenactors and i love you know i'm not gonna hold it against them and they always talk about wanting to go to williamsburg i'm like you can go but i'm staying here i'm like i <laughs> you're like let it, me it, off at the at the 7-eleven uh you that, know down the street i'll stay there i'm curious because I, I, and sometimes i think like even my therapist i think there's like a level where they all think i'm like Mostly joking, but I'm not kidding. At my core, you have a real I get, revulsion. I get rageful because I feel like <laughs> it's that like, oh, you're lying to me thing. Like I'm like, oh, what twix? What is that glowing object in your hand? Like <laughs> I know it's a phone. Just shut up. Like it, it uh. It actually fills me with rage, and I refuse to ever do that stuff ever again. Well, I will say, life. now that I found your kryptonite, uh, it'll be good to know. Uh, One of my favorite uh, bits of. You ever see Gravity Falls, the animated show on I, Disney? I've so many good things. There's just a bit where the town has one of these old like Founders Days, and everybody's basically doing all the things that you hate, where they're all dressed up, and they show the oh. uh, their uncle, uh, Uncle Grunkle Stan, is like trying to drive his car out of the town because he hates this like festival, and it gets stuck, and and one of these guys dressed as an old timey person walks up, and um he and he rolls his window down, and he's like, hey. Come help me! Uh, help me get my car unstuck. And the guy's like, he, the, the guy answers like, "What is this contraption known as a car? I know not this car." And he's like, "Come on, Steve! You're a mechanic for crying out loud." <laughs> <laughs> That's, yeah. That sums up that frustration you're talking about for me. Which yeah. is like, yeah, can I order this? No, you got to call it this new name. Oh, uh, this old time like, name. Just, oh, jeez. I can't. I can't handle it. Like, I, really, <laughs> I like some of those things. But oddly enough, anyway. it's only for that. Comic Con's fine. <laughs> yeah, see, so you, yeah, you'll do Comic Con, huh? Yeah. Dan <laughs> Stevens, by the way. What's that? Dan Stevens. That was the guy I meant. I looked it up ah. while, while we were riffing on on other stuff. Um, Dan Stevens, the man who invented Christmas. He plays. It's a. It's a. Uh, dramatization, sanitization, whatever you want to say, of Charles Dickens writing A Christmas Carol. And um, oh, that's cool. yeah, it's, it's a good movie. Uh, it's, it's a period piece, so get ready. But, you know, I'd suggest it. Uh, but um, what's his name? Uh, Christopher Plummer actually plays Scrooge because in this, it's one of these stories where uh, people like the the characters of the the story kind of appear to him here and there. And Scrooge is kind of personified as the antagonist, protagonist, and tortures him and kind of is making fun of him and like, you know, being Scrooge basically, right? And it's actually, even though it's not a Christmas carol, it's about the writing of a Christmas carol, they have uh they have the bit where he creates the scene in his mind of here's what's gonna happen to you, Scrooge. And Scrooge, as the character in his imagination, whatever, pleads with him just the same way as he pleads in the story, right? Um, to not do this to me, because at that point he's on the fence of whether or not he's actually just gonna screw. He's not thinking redemption at that point in the in, in as a writer. He's just thinking this is a, a morality tale that's going to show something bad happening to this guy, and uh, and so you're absolutely right. Like that redemption piece, and that's actually that's actually probably the best uh, scene I've ever seen of Christopher Plummer playing Scrooge for this one little part of the story, um, uh, showing it just straight out of the the thing. And that redemption's a huge part of this story, right? Yeah. And is it true that Christopher Plummer replaced Kevin Spacey? <laughs> In that movie? I'm just kidding. I didn't know that. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, there was a period where Kevin Spacey had to get taken out of a bunch of like Or just a as lot- a human. No. <laughs> Christopher Plummer became like the go-to guy to go fill in for every uh rapist. <laughs> I didn't know that. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Well, Money in the world, I think they filmed it with Kevin Spacey, and then they replaced it with Christopher Plummer. Oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. That's why when yeah. I watched The Usual Suspects, they they uh, deep faked Christopher, Christopher Plummer. Plummer in that. No, just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> Be kind of hard um, to edit around Spacey in that one, I would think. But yeah, <laughs> I mean, I, as I know, we had a kind of we have like we start to start kind of wrapping it up. Um, like overall thoughts, like isn't it 
wonderful to see this every year come around into new generations and generations and generations. And like, I feel like, you know, I'll be showing, I'll be in my, in the nursing home if I get, make it that far and I'll be watching this still. Yeah. That's a cool thing about it is that it bears repetition, which uh, there are people who take comfort in watching the same things over and over and over. And all of us probably have some of those things, but uh, yeah, I, I, I know that it, the other thing about it is that it makes it so accessible, uh, like generationally, and at different ages, for a little kid to sit down and say, let me watch a story of regret and death and life and loss and trauma and all of these things and to say, and just really have it be super accessible. And I think the Muppet format actually helps that even more to be the case because there's a lot of good depictions of A Christmas Carol that you can find. Um, I mean, you can't, you know, because of the period version, but uh, there's a lot of different, you know, versions that, they're not as accessible to children that are quite as young as the ones that will sit through this movie, right? Because uh, they'll sit there and for at least some part of it will be like, ooh, you know. So this this one really gets it out there, which is really pretty powerful. And I really think it's because of Gonzo and Rizzo. And I think what they did with, um, they did the the Halloween special this year, which was basically Gonzo and Rizzo. And it was, uh, it was awesome. Like, I love Rizzo, man. And especially my daughter is now obsessed with the, Muppet, the new Muppet Babies that they do, which is really adorable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's <laughs> really good. Her favorite, her favorite character is Gonzo, and I've never been so proud. <laughs> and uh, but and then she loves Rizzo too. But like Rizzo, I mean, especially Muppets Take Manhattan, he's one of the best side characters in those movies. Like specifically when he's like skating the butter, but in this movie though, when he um, when he <laughs> oh, when they're making over... pancakes and he's he's, he's uh, <laughs> greasing the pan by skating on it with butter on his feet, yeah. <laughs> Particularly in this movie, when he climbs the fence so that he just walks right through it, and God's just is like, "You're an idiot." <laughs> <laughs> One yeah, of there's... my favorite Gonzo moments of all time is actually in Christmas Carol when. Uh, there he's he's being a chimney sweep so they can spy on the the Cratchits, <laughs> and here you have Rizzo. He's like smells the goose cooking and he falls into the chimney and lands on a goose, right? Because he's sniffing, he's smelling goose and he falls into a chimney. And Gonzo's first reaction is, "I knew you weren't suited for literature." And like that's I don't know why, but that's the perfect <laughs> the perfect Gonzo line. <laughs> I know they don't even explain why Gonzo and Rizzo or there like in a weird way are they like were they t- is it time travel like i don't know it's just it's it's such well, a he's the he's the writer he's charles dickens gonzo yeah yeah he's playing charles dickens yeah. well everyone's gonna discredit everything i've said for this entire episode now <laughs> wow what a great muppet fan he didn't even know who gonzo yeah. played no i'm just I- Hope people remember the ADHD part. Like, listen, I watch a lot of things. I can I edit it all. I'll just edit yeah. this all out. So usually, yeah. it works for me though. I usually edit the episode so that I end up sounding smarter. Um, yeah, it's probably so. not hard if you have on this guy. Thank you for listening to the Court and Parts Podcast Network. To listen to more Court and Parts shows, visit courtemparts.com.